I'm going to roll right into Bryce Rudder. Bryce is a pal of ours. He's been with us before. He's a superb designer. He's going to talk about design and innovation. He's a Canadian. He went down to the States, decided to specialize in stuff related to mobile technology. Very forward thinking. Bryce, are you there? Yep. Come on. Good to see you again. Hey. How are you? Thanks very much. <laughs> Well, after the uh, first presentation, uh, what I'm going to do now is, is can my presentation and show you what I can do with a roll of quarters, okay? <laughs> uh, thanks very much for having me back, uh, Moses. Uh, the neat thing about presenting to a crowd like this after uh, uh, two days of parties is that most of you are still drunk, so if you don't understand or don't like what I say, you'll forget it by 10 o'clock. So I'm in good shape. This is the best slot to have. So I want to talk about uh, the promise of innovation uh, because uh, Many of you have heard this concept, uh, you know, uh, from your bosses or from the C office or more generally, you just need to get some of that innovative stuff, you know? So let's talk about it. Um, and for those of you who thought this was non-participatory, you can leave now because there is a test now and there is a test at the end. So I'm going to pose the question. I'm going to come back and pick on a few of you. What is the best design product that you own? It's probably one of those things that you bought and the logical side of your brain said, that's way too much money. And the other side of your brain said, but I'll look really cool in that thing, right? So I'll come back to that. So I'm asked this quite a bit. You know, I, I need to make an innovative leap. I need to surpass the competition. OK, what else? That's it. That's your design brief. Go for it. So I want to take you on a journey of what people think innovation is. And I want to debunk a lot of the core myths that surround it, and I want to present a concept for what I see as the real gold standard for innovation. So you'd like to think, and most would agree, that creativity has something to do with innovation, right? Well, if you look at what uh, Tom Dish says, it's the ability to connect uh, relationships that other people don't see. It's like connecting dots that other people don't connect. All right, I'll buy that. For this crowd, I'm happy to know that most people know who Lindsey Buckingham is and who Fleetwood Mac is. But I've been in conference halls before where people are looking like, who is Fleetwood Mac? And it's like, oh, man, you make me feel so old. But he was being interviewed on NPR, and uh, he was asked, well, you know, how do you really, you know, create new music? And he said, I just walk around and I, I act like an antenna, and I just suck it all in. And it inspires me somehow. I don't know how. So I think that's really part of the equation of innovation. But if you look at what Tom uh, or Theodore Levitt says, is that creativity alone is not the only source of innovation. It's a piece to the puzzle. So I want to bust that myth that if you're highly creative, then therefore you will be highly innovative. Not true. I'd like to think that thinking has something to do with innovation. And I think everyone in here would agree, well, of course, you know, if you can't think, how can you be innovative, all right? So let's kind of look at that for a second. So many companies think, all right, I'm going to go out and I'm going to find someone with a superior IQ. Maybe they have a bunch of patents behind their names. I'm going to put them in a corner office. I'm going to give them an Aeron chair. I'm going to give them a really nice Italian task light and give them some northern exposure. And they're going to save the company. It's bullshit, right? It doesn't work. Things are way too complicated today to be innovative, to leave it to a sole person. It's not an individual sport anymore. Innovation is a team sport. It's the only way to really do it. How many people have been in brainstorming sessions? You walk in and they say, all right, lock the door. No one gets out of here until we have 100 ideas. All right. Everyone looks around and goes, Whoa, this is going to be a long day, all right? So what happens in that dynamic is the first 5, 10, 15 ideas are actually practical, and you can actually make them and make some money on them. And then people start looking at their watch and say, hmm, it's going to be a long day. How about, and it's like the crazy ideas come out. So I want to tell you that it's not the quantity of ideas when you're going through an innovative process. It's the quality of the ideas. And what really works best in those innovative brainstorming sessions 
is 15 minutes, get out of the room. All right? It's quality, not quantity. So I want to show you what some corporations think innovation is. All right? So here's one. There's marketing-driven innovation, and I have it in quotations because I really don't believe this is innovation. And this is driven by the market where you throw a lot of money at it and you really follow the competition. Well, they did that, so let's add one more feature. Nope, not innovation. There's brand-driven innovation where you want to live the dream. Every time I walk by an Abercrombie and Fitch and I look at the six-pack on these teens and the shaved chests, and then I get home at night, and I look at myself, and I go, oh, man, <laughs> it's not my brand, you know? I'm not living that dream. I'm just dreaming that dream, though, right? There's manufacturing-driven innovation. Here's some brands that you'll know. It's all about speed to market. I've got to use that equipment. I don't give a damn. You know, just make it on that piece of equipment. Get it out there. It's all about volume and driving down cost. Here's another way, engineering-driven. You know, you look at some of these brands, and I'll, I'll pick on BMW. Magnificent cars, highly complicated. I've been in rooms with design teams. They say, well, let's, you know, especially in the smartphone category, look at the stuff you have in your pocket. Right, we can add these features. It's like, who gives a shit, right? But we can. It's only another few lines of code. It's like, is it driven by a user need, or is it driven by you tech heads that just want to stick more stuff in there because you can, all right? It's engineering-driven, all right? Not really smart. Now, here's the juice. User-centered innovation. This is where it's at. And this is what I want to leave you with is that one of the primary takeaways is that if you want to be innovative, you need to think about it from the inside out. Think about the people who are buying your stuff, who are the ultimate judge and jury. And then figure out how to build it, how to get it there, you know, through the distribution channel, and how to get it there on time and on budget, okay? as opposed to the flip side, which most of these other companies do. They determine what you need, as opposed to you telling us what you need. So if you imagine me trying to design a product for everyone in this room, you know, look around. You know, we're all not normal, OK? <laughs> Especially in this crowd, all right? <laughs> so this is really tough. But the way to create innovative products and innovative consumer experiences is to think about how we think, feel, and behave. So I want to talk about that. I want to give you a few examples. I could go outside, I could take two pizzas in this box, bring in the box, take two people from the crowd, and on the second pizza, I'm going to put it on a really nice piece of china, put a little bit of basil on there, I'm going to put some uh, peppers on there that you may or may not eat, and I'll guarantee you that the one on the right is going to taste better. Right? You know that. You've gone to restaurants where you come out and you say, that was an incredible meal. What was the food like? Yeah, I think it was okay. But the presentation, the service, the ambiance, it is the total experience that really matters. So when you design things from a user-centered innovation space, you need to think about the experience, not just the thing. All right, another test. I could take you across, you know, Lake Balsam, up north here, in this, or would you prefer to go in that? All right, different experience. Hey, some people say, well, it's just a car, I really don't care. Well, I'll guarantee you, if you walk in with a Yugo, and I'm sitting there in a McLaren or a Ferrari or a, uh, you know, an R8, I can make, a, make you smile in a heartbeat compared. So when you think about different brands and you think about where they scale on some kind of an emotional index, and you may argue with me, well, that should be up higher or lower. I don't care, right? I just want to make the point that different brands take you on different journeys. And the ones near the top really look at more than just the car, you know, the computer, you know, the airplane ride, or the mobile device. They're really looking at, you know, the virtual interface, they're looking at the design, the sound, how does it feel, every aspect of that experience. All right, I want to show you some bad consumer experiences. And this is uh, really apropos for the people who have traveled to come to this conference. You know, now I can't take my pocket knife with me when I travel because I'm going to bring down the jet, right? So I order a burger, and I'm presented with an enormous task of getting in to the Heinz ketchup bottle. You look around the room, and the tools at your disposal are usually your fork, 
a dull knife, and a corkscrew. So I always choose the corkscrew because it has a pointy end, right? But how many people have struggled to get into this? This is, this is crazy design, right? This is not a good experience. This is bad experience. So the concept of waiting for your ketchup is really elongated, but they didn't plan on this. How about this? I don't care how many times I plug in the same USB into my computer, why is it always upside down, right? <laughs> You know, it's like, it's like with women trying to find things in your purse. Why is it always in the bottom of your purse, right? Nothing's on the top. Is there a top inside a woman's purse? I want to know that, right? I don't think so. All right. So when you think about this user innovation, or excuse me, a user-centered innovation, how the hell do you do it, all right? I want to talk about that for a bit. Well, when I say ergonomics, most people, you know, your eyes will glaze over. Yeah, I bought one of those ergonomically designed things. I took it home, and it was awful. All right, well, that's faux ergonomics, and that's usually uh, ergomania. It's a marketing term. When done right, you know that it works because it fits you like a glove, and it reacts to you. So I call this emotional ergonomics. And it really comes down to looking at ergonomics on a sensory level. And you know this. When you close the door in your car, if it thunks rather than the tin can sound of the 80s cars that Detroit figured out way too late that the Germans had mastered for 20, 30 years earlier, it sounds like junk. Or when you walk up to a stereo and you turn the knob and it goes as opposed to this kind of sloppy tinny sound, right? All of those things really matter. So when you think about you know, the user experience, the way I come at it is I say, well, ergonomics is not something that you sprinkle on the front end of a design and development program. It really frames the thinking, and it's a strategy. And depending upon the task that the product is supposed to be used for, it will really define the sensory experience or the user experience that you need to try to generate. Now, I'm an industrial designer by training, and First of all, I'll be the, the, uh, the uh, person to tell you that most designers are really crazy, okay? They wear black all the time, you know? If you ever go to a design conference, you'll see 95 shades of black, you'll see the wildest sunglasses and eyewear, and everyone's got a watch that you can't tell the time on, all right? <laughs> Self included, all right? So we're famous for designing also cool looking shit you can't make or make money on. So I don't want to talk about that because that's art. And I'm not in the art business. I'm in the business of helping companies make designs that make money. All right? So I just want to make sure that you don't think that I'm talking about this you know, fluffy stuff that doesn't, doesn't really generate the cash. It's all about ringing up the cash register, which is OK. Because if I fulfill your needs, and I also make money on it, isn't, isn't that a fair thing? You know. It's when I cheat you, and you buy a crappy product, and you go home, and you say, I'll never buy anything from that brand again. So bad design barks, good design is seamless. So it's all about experience design. So I think that's part of the DNA of what a user-centered innovation process is. And in my lifetime, these are the two dudes. Both are a little quirky if you've read a lot about them. But man, they figured it out. They were not designing things, they were designing experiences from the ground up, literally, and from the underground, you know, with Walt Disney. I was at a presentation at Harley Earl, and he was talking about, we don't sell motorcycles, this is what we sell, <laughs> right? They make more money selling accessories than they do selling motorcycles. <laughs> no kidding. Now think about that. And they're, they're, remember when Harley was going under? They changed their strategy. They got down and they said, we're going to have seven chassis. And the way you buy a Harley, it doesn't matter who you are, you walk in and say, all right, which chassis do you want, which style? And then they show you a catalog like this, say, all right, what fenders do you want, what bags do you want? So when you walk out, you have done a custom design job on your Harley. Big difference. Huge success for these guys. All right, so let's kind of look at what is the DNA of innovation, what really makes it happen. Well. First thing is I want to distinguish between short-term stuff, which is really you're renovating your product line and you're doing it, you need something to, just to keep it alive, as opposed to innovation, where you're really trying to look for new paradigms, new ideas, new ways to solve the same problems, or really to reevaluate the way we do something and reinvent it. Very different points of view. 
How many people here have met someone you say, you know, I don't believe a word that person says, you know? They have no integrity or they screwed me over, right? When you are developing a consumer experience, it's a great concept to think about design integrity. You know, is it, is it true to what it's representing? Is it giving you a good ride? Or is it misrepresenting the facts? I think you need to think global, you need to think about what's going on at a local level, and there's also this kind of tribal knowledge, which you need to figure out and you need to get at somehow, you know, in, in my case, using a lot of ethnographic research. You need to ask this question, what if, right? I don't care how many times I, I go into meetings, you know, and someone says, well, we can't do that. Well, why can't you do that? Well, we've never done that before. Well, that's amazing. You know, that's why we call this a new idea, right? <laughs> you know? And actually, you can do it. And I'm going to ship you a shoebox of stuff where they're doing it in other industries. And you'll get the call 24 hours later and say, yeah, we can do that. OK. It's a nice tool to relax the constraints to allow you to think outside the box. Every detail matters, how it sounds, how it feels, and you know that. When you pick up, let's say, a smartphone, or you pick up a knife, or you pick up, you know, anything, if the center of gravity is off, you're not going to say, well, this, hey, hey, honey, the CG is wrong on this knife. You know, you're just going to pick it up, and it's not going to make an impact. But when you go to that nice restaurant, and they have nice cutlery, and the sound of the cutlery when they put it down on the table, all of that stuff matters, all right? So I'm talking to you acoustically. You know, what's the acoustic signature? What's the perceptual signature, what's the tactile signature. All of that stuff is critically important. All right, this is an interesting topic, and this is my war path today. So I was here in 2004. It's been an interesting, uh, you know, decade for me. Since the last time I saw everyone here, I've had two strokes. And I'm here to tell you that when you're designing medical equipment and you haven't been a patient, you really don't get it. Right? How many people have been in the hospital? Wasn't that a great time, right? <laughs> huh? You know, you walk in and the first thing they do is they strip you of every ounce of your damn dignity and say, hey, would you put this on? <laughs> and then you look at it and say, my arms don't go back there. Could you tie it up for me as your butt is hanging out? You know, the only person who hasn't tried on one of these things is the guy or gal who invented it. This is bad design. It has nothing to do with the consumer experience. Well, we do this so if we need to crash you, we can just tear it off. It's like, come on. Have you seen perforated things? You know, you could work that out in a different way. <laughs> All right, come on. But I'm here to tell you, man, dignity is a big thing. And it wasn't until I became a little bit older and it's getting more and more important. All right? And it's also getting more important as I see my parents' age and I see my siblings' age. You know, my dad pulled me aside one day and he lovingly calls me, my nickname is Hammerhead, because I'd never listen, right? He said, hey, Hammerhead, what is it with you designers? You know, you think I want to wear white shoes with Velcro on? And here's a man that used to wear English Dax shoes. You know, used to love great cars, you know? You think I like a telephone with numbers this big? Can't you do something that really allows me to live a distinguished life as I age. It was an interesting basement scene. I remember going uh, to mom and dad's house, and as a veteran, he had everything that he, ha he could have given to him to help him get around. He had ambulators, he had, you know, walkers, he had chairs that would eject him out of it, you know, halfway across the room, and they're all in the basement. I said, Dad, you know, you could use these things. He said, I don't want to use them, they just remind me that I need them, all right? That is a big problem. And it is an enormous opportunity. This is low-hanging fruit for innovation, designing for boomers. And yeah. All right, how about this, you know? The state of the art. Now, I can tell you right now, <laughs> you, you wait for it, wait for it. If I get out of my Lexus, I trip and fall, and I break my hip. Oh, um, you know, Dr. Rutter, you need one of these. I'm looking at it, this is going to make me feel real good, yeah? <laughs> But when they throw in the tennis balls for free, I feel a lot better, <laughs> right? So many of us are old enough to remember the umbrella stroller. You remember that kind of uh, crude thing, right? Now look at strollers, right? 
Strollers are branded. You can buy a Jeep stroller, you know? There's a stroller out there right now, and I, I, didn't, uh, uh, I didn't have time to get it in here to the presentation. You press a button, and it closes itself up. It has a solar array, you know, to recharge your cell phone. Uh, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. Oh, it has headlights, too, because <laughs> you, you never know when you're going down the highway, you know? <laughs> so how about this, you know? I guarantee you, if you give me the same cost structure in half a bottle of wine, I can make that ugly piece of junk on the left actually be inspiring that you'd want to get in it and ride it and have the same kind of character as a cool car. Come on, this is engineering-driven design, you know? They don't care, you know, they're just trying to make money. All right, so I'm in the hospital, all right? <laughs> and I look down, and here's my first meal that I get to eat. My Airedale gets better presentations than what I got there, all right? Come on, come on. Oh, and you're half-drugged, you've had a stroke, and they give you, like, flat cutlery that you can't pick up off the flat surface, and then they give you, like, you know, jello. Come on, I gave up jello after I started throwing it in the ceiling in college cafeterias, you know? <laughs> Isn't that what jello was invented for? You know, it's like another version of, uh, you know, silly putty or goo, right? This is awful, come on, you know? <laughs> so this concept of empathy, you cannot be innovative, and I don't care whether you're designing a business solution or a particular product, unless you empathize and live in the shoes of the person that is gonna use it. You need to hear what they hear, you need to see through their eyes, you need to feel through their hands. That is so important to do that. I don't know, this wasn't my physician, he wasn't too empathetic to me, you know? <laughs> Maybe I'm going to the wrong type of hospital, you know? You know, this is like cuckoo nest stuff, huh? All right, a lot of people, final thoughts. All that innovation stuff, we can't afford it. No way. Oh, okay, wait, wait for it. Now, I would like to be in the room when people looked down at the paper and saw some of these products being developed, all right? Especially the Aztec. I hope no one owns an Aztec, because I, I may hurt your feelings here in the next 30 seconds, all right? <laughs> so can you imagine someone said, I think that looks really beautiful. <laughs> all of these are examples that designers do do drugs, okay? <laughs> so everyone says, you know, innovation is easy. Well, if it was so darn easy, everyone would be doing it. But it is not easy. And so many times, once you get to the end point and you've got a really creative, well thought out solution, people look at it and say, well, that's obvious. Well, if it was so obvious, why didn't someone do it 10 years earlier, all right? But the obviousness of it is really part of the innovative solution. It talks to you. It's explicitly obvious, it's unambiguous, you know how to use it. So this is really tough stuff, all right? And it takes a lot of courage. And especially in North America, where executives are comped on a quarterly basis, they will not make long-term strategic decisions because they know they're gonna be out of there in a year, two years, and to invest $80 million in the next big idea and tool up for it, it'll never happen on their watch. As opposed to a Japanese corporation, which is, has much more of a longer view. So this needs to be broken Interesting study, I recommend it, you can email me, I'll send, it, send you a PDF, but they, they looked at at Harvard, someone did a study and they interviewed guys like Jeff Bezos and other big brains, you know, what does it really take to be innovative? And these are the five traits that are very common. They associate things, they connect dots that people, people don't typically connect together. They ask questions, and they never stop asking questions. They're like that, that child, you know, that we all were, you know, nah, 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 right? Remember, your children asking question after question after question, right? You gotta do that, though. They observe, they watch, and they watch. They watch people using the current products, and they look for the quirks, the ticks, the adaptive behaviors that we all have, and they experiment. Should, networking should be on the next line. They experiment with uh, with everything. It's, and duct tape and toothpicks is okay, all right? That's experimenting. 
And the last thing that they do is they network. They bring together people that are typically not in the same room together. So that's what a, an innovator's DNA looks like. Last slide for you here is I've actually heard these from corporations, right? And these are excuses for not innovating. And as they go down the list, I didn't make these things up. You can't make this stuff up, right? They get really crazy. And these are bad excuses. <laughs> Last slide. What's the best design product that you own? Get out, get out more often. Go, go, go buy something. You. Your chopsticks, okay. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, you. My oral bean toothbrush. Oh, now you're sucking up. <laughs> you are the smartest guy in this audience. <laughs> Moses, what's the best design product that you own? My Jaguar. All right, man. All right. Listen, thanks very 1954 much. 1954 XK120 drop head coupe. No way. Really? Well, I'm a car man. All right. Thank thanks very so much. much. Thanks very I, much. Let's take it out this way. Now hold on, hold on a second. Yep. I, I indulged Bryce a little bit with time because he was touching on stuff that's hugely important to me. Bryce, you may not know it, I'm the president of CARP. CARP mm -hmm. is the Canadian analog of AARP. Mm -hmm. And we've been on to exactly what you've been saying, which is there's a huge world of new design necessary for a world that is aging. And to that rogues gallery where you put the Heinz ketchup bottle, yeah. who are the crazy people who design those wide mouth jars? I know. Right? Yeah. And you're saying to yourself, the chairman of that company does not use his own product mm -hmm. or her own product. The president does. Nobody in that entire company yeah. has any idea what it takes to open up that big jar. Well, I'll tell you a story on that mm -hmm. because we, we've been in so many instances where you go in and you take in a product concept and someone tries to use it and they say it's too small. And you look at the uh, person and say, well, you have a free can. You know, your knuckles drag on the ground when you walk, you know, <laughs> you're, you're out there in the two-tail distribution, we don't care about you, sorry, mm. you know, we're going for the mass market. Mm. So usually those, those uh, faux pas are a result of the, the designer having a different, you know, set of scale personally, and they base it on themselves, or the person, the decision maker, is not thinking about the user. It's based on, well, it doesn't work for me. Or the cheapest jar. The exactly, jar exactly. Fine. Off the yeah, shelf. Off yeah. in Albania somewhere. Exactly. It was two cents. Well, uh, I'd love to follow up with you because we right. have the ambition to create a line of Zoomer-oriented products. Dynamite. Including a breakthrough, a can opener that actually works. Why the can, though? Wouldn't that be it? <laughs> 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 Thanks That's very much. That's so good. That's Take care. so good. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat>